This video, I will be talking about self-organizing maps, or SOMs. And uh, there's, a, there's an Excel file here that you can play with to uh, get a deeper understanding of how the algorithm works. Uh, it's going to be attached below this video. And uh, to get a deeper understanding of self-organizing maps, I highly recommend uh, looking at this book uh, by Simon Haken. kind of explains how the algorithm works. Self-organizing maps are an example of unsupervised learning and also competitive learning. So I'll just explain that in a second here. Um, and there's a lot of uh, sort of algorithmic detail and formulae in this workbook. I'm not gonna, going to go over the math in this video. Uh, it's going to be a brief video. I just want to explain sort of in, in, in an intuitive way how self-organizing maps work. And hopefully that helps you understand the core concepts and you can imagine these, this sort of an algorithm being applied to more complex problems. So this is going to be a very simple problem that we deal with here. And you can see that simple problem on the data tab. And to visualize the problem, we have some data. So we have some data in two dimensions, x1 and x2. And here we have uh, selected a three-point pattern. And so we have these three points. And uh, these are represented by these sort of red dots, is, is our data. So that's what, what our data looks like. And I chose two dimensions so we can visualize what our uh, input space looks like. Okay, so that's our input space. We have sort of x1 and x2, and we can visualize that. Now, the idea behind SOMs or self-organizing maps is we want to be able to encode this complexity of information. Okay, so there's a lot of data points here. How many are there? Let's say there are, there are about 100 data points here. Do these data points represent a simpler reality? Can we abstract the key pieces of information? Instead of dealing with 100 points as in data, we can deal with maybe three points. Because when we visualize the data, we can see, well, really, it's just three things. Uh, there are three types of things here that are clustered together. And maybe instead of dealing with three with 100 data points, we can really represent them by three data points. And that's the idea here. And and can we get a, a, an algorithm to learn what those three points are automatically? Okay, so that's the algorithm that's called self-organizing maps. And of course, in two dimensions, it's easy. It seems like an easy problem, but if you have a multi-dimensional problem, you have like a hundred dimensions. You can't really plot it. So that's where the math then gives you the answer. And let's say you have a million data points in a hundred dimensions. You have a hundred different columns. And then you want to say, well, I want to really extract the key pieces of information that are represent these hundred, these million data points across a hundred different dimensions by maybe just a hundred key features. So if you're familiar with data science and predictive modeling and statistics, you, you might say, okay, there are some parallels here with principal components analysis, and that's true, that this is sort of a generalization of uh, PCA, you know, principal components analysis. But um, that's just a side note here. So uh, let me just explain at a high level how this works. So we have this neuron lattice. This is a discrete output space. So we, we are defining that here. We have these four neurons, okay? And we have these starting weights for these neurons, and we're just ex expressing them in this grid, two-dimensional grid, R1 and R2. And that's how it looks like. This is the discrete output space. We are going to project these neurons from the output space to the input space. Okay, And we are going to project them in this input space, and we're going to update the weights of the neurons so that they are able to find the pattern that's represented by this input data. So I'm going to, uh, as I'm showing this video, I'll also show you how to use this file. So the first thing to do is to initialize. So I'm going to click initialize. And you'll notice that the neurons just get random locations. So their projection from the output space to the input space is random. So I'll do it again. So every time I do it, they just kind of get in, in a random spot. Then I can click the, the algorithm 
and hopefully, so what we expect to see is that hopefully we know that there are three points here because we can visually see it in this simple case. So we will expect that out of the four neurons that are available to us, we only use three. And uh, we sort of discard the fourth because we don't need four neurons here. So how would the algorithm work? So for example, let's say if we look at some data here and the first example of a data point is somewhere around here. And the neuron that's closest to that data point is neuron four. So I mentioned this is an example of competitive learning. So how competitive learning works is we have four neurons here. Each time we present a data example to these neurons, one of them is going to win based on the proximity of that neuron to an input data point when that neuron is projected from output space to input space. Okay, And the reason this projection is important right now, you're like, well, why are we projecting from output space? Well, in the output space, we have two dimensions. In the input space, we can have different than two dimensions. So uh, don't want to get into the math once again, but, but that's where we can project neurons into different levels of dimensions to make the pro problem more generalizable. But anyway, so let's select the first data point, and here I can sort of hack the algorithm and just select the first data point. And we'll see that the neuron 4 has won, just as we expected, because we can visually see the neuron 4 just happened to be closest, and then neuron 4 is where the weights are being changed. Very slightly, so 0.01, the rest of the weights are not being affected. So the other neurons in this first example are not being affected. If we select a neuron that's here, what's the closest to that one? It's kind of hard to tell, but I, I suppose it's neuron 1. So let me select a, a neuron that's up there. And we see that, well, this time neuron 1 has 1. And neuron 1 gets their weights updated. So this is sort of the update to the weights of the neuron to, to make neuron 1 get closer to this one. So whichever neuron wins get, get, kind of starts to get closer to that cluster. So now I'm going to run the algorithm to, uh, to hopefully see how this algorithm works. And uh, let's see. So I'm going to click it. And we can see that the neurons start uh, shifting. So it's slightly slow <laughs> in this video. I mean, the Excel file is simpler, but um, it takes a little time to kind of run through. But we can see that some of the neurons are kind of getting closer and closer to the clusters as the different data points are updating. They're moving one at a time as we are presenting them different randomized samples from the data. And it's saying in this case, the algorithm has failed to converge. So try increasing the number of iterations or allow for a higher stopping criterion. Um, but still doing a pretty good job, um, even though it failed to converge, it's still doing a reasonably good job. We can edit some of the parameters here. So for example, I can increase the learning parameter so that uh, hopefully it learns faster. So let me initialize it again, sort of a random pattern, and run the algorithm again and see if it learns hopefully a little bit quicker and it should converge soon here so there we go so neural network has needed three neurons and two iterations of the data so iteration meaning it's kind of gone over the data set once and then twice and that was all that was needed and you can play with this you can do like a two point pattern Okay, and then we initialize the neurons again. They're kind of in these random locations. And then when we run the algorithm, two of them are hopefully converge and find the clusters on their own. So it's unsupervised. We're not telling them what the right examples are, what the wrong examples are. We're just presenting the algorithm with data and asking it to abstract key features from the data automatically. So in this case, the neuron need, the network needed two neurons and two iterations to, to, to do it. And you can play with it. There's four point, and there's a random pattern as well. Of course, if, if it's random, it's not going to converge. So that's just kind of um, 
using that as an example that if the data is truly random, then the, you know you <laughs> you're not going to be able to extract abstract a uh, hundred data points that are truly random. You can't express them by by ten because that's not going to be a very good representation. So anyway, so this is how this this file works. Um, and you can play with some of the parameters. Um, there is a neighborhood parameter uh, on the input tab. Um, that's interesting. And the learning rate uh, parameter that I just kind of showed you here how to adjust. You can see that as well. So in this case, we have four point pattern and we needed four neurons. We needed all of the neurons that we have. So if we had a five point pattern, you know, we would use up our four neurons and we wouldn't be able to ex adequately express the fifth cluster of data points. So, so that's it. So hopefully this file gives you an understanding of how self-organized maps work. Uh, this is an example of competitive learning and uh, unsupervised learning. And you can see how we can present a neural network with, uh, with data. And the neural network will just automatically find and abstract the key features and patterns from the data. So hopefully this was helpful. Feel free to comment um, and let me know if uh, with any feedback or any questions. Thank you for listening.